Good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce this session. My name is Kerry Huang, and I, I'm from Veer Biotechnology. I head up the chronic infections group there in the clinical research, uh, which oversees our hepatitis as well as our HIV programs. So it's my pleasure to open the satellite session today, organized by the HIV Vaccine Industry Partnership of the IAS Corporate Partnership Program on Swinging into Full Gear, Strengthening Industry Engagement in HIV Vaccine Research and Development. This satellite will discuss barriers to industry involvement in HIV vaccine R&D, including recommendations for activating and optimizing industry involvement uh, and participation. The event will also be the opportunity for us to formally launch the IAS HIV Vaccine Industry Partnership, a multi-stakeholder group aiming to support the industry's contribution to HIV vaccine R&D by addressing and minimizing barriers to engagement. We would also like to thank the organizers and in particular, the IS Corporate Program Partnership sponsors for making this session possible. And we also welcome all the participants, both in person and virtual, as well as our speakers and panelists shown on this slide. Please note uh, that all virtual participants are muted. Please place your questions into the Q&A section of the conference platform. We also encourage our in-person participants to raise questions and discussion topics during the panel discussion. To leave a question, please use the QR code that will be projected on the screen during the session to access the Q&A platform to use the mic or to use the microphones that are positioned in the session room. Lastly, given our packed agenda, we kindly ask that all the speakers please not to go over their allotted time slots and to allow time for discussion in the end. I am now handing over to my co-chair who needs no introduction, Linda Gale Bechter, Executive Director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center to start our satellite with the first presentation. Thank you, Kerry, and um, it is my pleasure uh, to join you uh, this afternoon and welcome everyone to what I consider a very important satellite, which is not only to re-engage the science, but to re-engage with the, the vaccine, HIV vaccine science, which I think is so important. My, my name, as I say, is Linda Gale Becker. I'm from the Desmond Tutu uh, HIV Center based at the University of Cape Town, and I'm a long-time clinical trialist who has been involved in a number of HIV vaccines. I do not have any diminution of, uh, of, my, um, of my enthusiasm for an HIV vaccine. And the reason for this is that just this week that we are sitting and involved and, and running around meeting individuals at this conference during this week, 5,000 young women and girls became infected with an incurable infection that may also stigmatize and discriminate their futures impact their relationships, and put at risk their ability to have healthy children. In 20 years, we have not moved the dial on new infections in young women and girls in my region. The late Gita Ramji, known perhaps to some of you who worked so hard on microbicides and sadly we lost uh, to COVID-19, she followed thousands of women through microbicide trials and she described this poignantly before her death. Despite seeking prevention and knowing their vulnerabilities, these women have not been able to protect themselves against HIV. Around the world in this last year, 1.5 million people became infected in 2021. And I would hazard and argue that it's likely to be an underestimation given the upheaval of the last two years and the tragedy unfolding in the Eastern Europe, Central Asia region. Of the infect infected in the world, still 1.7 million are children and many are in the young key population category. Young people struggle to adhere to their medication, and AIDS remains a leading cause of death in adolescents globally. In fact, this is the one community population we haven't been able to bend the mortality curve on, despite all of our progress in the last 40 years. 
We need an HIV vaccine. I'll say it again, we urgently need a safe and effective, affordable HIV preventive vaccine. I'm sure like many of you here, I've learned a number of things in the last two years. The first I would say is that pandemics such as COVID-19 can cause enormous public health disruption and chaos and tip already faltering health systems. This can and did threaten supply chains, care cascades, and basic access to prevention for millions around the world. A vaccine which relies, after the initial vaccine administration, on the ongoing magic of the immune system offers hope in this type of crisis, and that we can expect, uh, sadly, I think, more of this kind of crises to happen. This is especially critical for individuals who struggle to regularly engage in services due to stigma or simply because they are young. The second lesson I've learned from COVID-19 is that when resources, academia, private brain power and other power, agencies, politics, funders and the whole world come together, you can make and license a vaccine to a new pathogen from scratch within nine months. This is extraordinary and I think really sets a precedent in our world today. The resources we speak of are orders of magnitude more than we have seen for HIV, TB, and malaria roll together. And that remains a challenge as to whether we can ever amass those kinds of resources uh, for HIV. But the brain power today does exist. The platforms we know exist. The partners out there are there. Somehow we need to bring these magical partnerships together and ignite the same passion we saw in COVID-19. So today, Carrie and I will uh, be leading a, a, a great panel of individuals who will help us understand what some of these public-private partnerships can look like, what we at the IAS are, are trying to do, and describe some of the work that we believe needs to happen as we ignite this passion, engage and re-engage exciting partners to come together so that we can finally get to the vision we have of a safe, preventive, affordable vaccine for the world. So with that, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be handing over to a pre-recorded video from my great colleague, Maureen Luber, who is also on our advisory group. She's a senior program manager at AVAC and she will present on the importance of community engagement with the pharmaceutical industry for HIV prevention research. Over to you, Maureen. All right, thank you so much. Uh, good evening for those of you who are in Montreal. I guess it's good morning on my end because it's just after midnight. Um, I've been asked, as you heard from me, I've been asked to share a community perspective on the importance of uh, community engagement with the pharmaceutical industry, especially in the HIV prevention research. And this is actually as one way of building a strong collaboration between the industry and non-industry partners. And I, I just wanted to start, you know, by acknowledging that the HIV vaccine research field has actually taught us so much about the oh. HIV virus. And at the same time, there's actually a lot that we are yet to learn from the field. And I think as we enter this new, new phase of vaccine discovery, now, of course, with more advanced uh, designs, technologies, uh, platforms, um, uh, it's important for us to keep reflecting on the important lessons that we have learned from the field so far to date, especially as the search for an effective HIV vaccine you know, gets more complex. I think there is need for more innovative approaches to answer the remaining question. I think it's uh, most important what we need is actually a more coordinated strategy that brings together the different stakeholders to unlock you know, the remaining uh, questions and, and, and challenges as we have actually gathered today, which is why I'm so excited today you know, that we'll be officially launching this partnership. You know, uh, of course, following a few disappointing results from the vaccine research field with a few trials being stopped, uh, stopped on an efficacy. I think there's still a glimmer of hope. Um, we know we had in area sessions today that there are still a few empirical uh, trials in the field. And of course, uh, a few mRNA vaccine uh, uh, trials 
you know, that I've just listened to being launched. Of course, I was in a session with Robin where he also just reminded us that, you know, about the importance of right communication, especially when it comes to mRNA, you know, technologies. You know, just because mRNA platforms helped accelerate COVID vaccine discovery does not mean that we see the same speed in HIV vaccine. So it's very important that we get the messages right out there to avoid, you know, creating unrealistic expectations. We also know that, of course, there's a lot of, you know, advancements in the experimental medicine vaccine trials design. So I think in a, you know, in br briefly, there's, there's a lot to be explained excited about as the field moves move forward. I would like, of course, to thank IAS for recognizing the importance of partnership and collaboration as a critical success factor uh, for the discovery of an uh, effective HIV vaccine. Um, in this meeting, of course, we have, I know we have both industry and then industry partner, and each one of us has a very, very critical role uh, to play. But the question remains, how can we make this partnership meaningful? And what is the importance of community engagement uh, with the industry? First, I think uh, we need to use this platform to critically analyze what we have learned as I, as I mentioned earlier, but also to, uh, to strategize on how can we create that coordinated strategy. I think as we advance this partnership, we also need to recognize the importance, uh, the important role of community engagement. And again, I would like to thank IAS for extending the invitation of communities to join this partnership. The HIV prevention treatment uh, you know, accomplishments that we have achieved today you know, are nothing short of you know, remarkable. And we know that communities have actually played a very significant role. You know, just to remind us that you know, the early rapid advancements in life-saving combination of ARG actually occurred largely because of the vocal and effective push from the community and patient advocates who actually demanded that they needed the treatment and they collaborated with the researchers and the industry. Of course, as far as community engagement is concerned, we all know that we have come a long way. If we remember in the early 80s, you know, HIV researchers used to be, I would say somehow siloed from the community and the relationship between communities and the researchers and the industry was not good then until, uh, up until NIAD had you know, started recommending that community members, you know, should be included in the SCDG trial groups meetings at that time. And later on, we started, you know, seeing community involvement in HIV research being formalized in form of community advisory board. And since then, you know, community advisory boards have now become an essential, an essential component of most of the clinical trial networks today. I think we're going to appreciate that today, you know, most researchers, they are now able to partner with community advisory board and use those platforms to identify potential study challenges and problems, but also use those platforms to inform what are the best you know, recruitment procedures that can be used, but also use that to monitor research. And in the end, when we have the results, you know, try our researchers are also use, able to use that platform as a way to disseminate the findings. But, but that said, we all know that there's still a lot to be done in order for us to achieve that meaningful community engagement in the HIV prevention research. And as we know, as we know that a lot of, you know, sometimes it's a community engagement tends to be more window dressing and ticking the box, and we need to address that. So how should the industry engage communities? I think when you talk about community engagement, we should, I think now it's time for us to start seeing less of that top-down engagement approaches. Whereby, and when I say top-down engagement approaches, I mean having a researcher or maybe industry expert developing an idea on their own and then testing that idea on the community and then proceeding to implement research. Now I think moving forward, what we need is to start seeing more of bottom-up approaches. And by that, I mean having, you know, uh, researchers and uh, and industry experts are appreciating that they need to start by having a community being able to identify their own problems and then involving the same communities in that iterative process of trying to identify solutions and progressing into research. But of course, for that to happen, it means that our research grants and budgets need to look different. They need to take that into consideration. I think just mentioning that community engagement, I think it's become a, a thing, right? Or just adding a sentence or two about community engagement in our research grants without adding a budget right, to support that. It's as bad as not including it, right? 
just on the same. I think when engaging communities, sometimes as researchers, we tend to focus on this you know, concept of cultural competence. We want to become masters of the cultural values you know, uh, in, of communities. But I think what we need more, most is you know, that cultural humility, right? Cultural humility is what actually helps us to be aware of our own implicit biases and to be more respectful and understanding and willing to learn from the communities. And, and also when you talk about cultural humility, it actually helps us to, yeah, to appreciate that communities are experts in their own way. I think communities, I know, are tired of this type of engagement that, like I said, that are more of ticking the box. You know, sometimes communities also get tired of being asked now and again what they want and what they think works when there's nothing that is done to address, you know, um, uh, those, um, out, the outcomes from those consultations meetings. What communities need is true collaboration. You know, sometimes you always say, oh, communities don't understand the science, right? We need to help them understand. We need to make them understand. We need to invest in research leaders. We need to make sure that communities understand the research ethics, right? And that by and once they understand, they are able to under identify the potential harms of different you know, clinical trials happening in their community and be able to have that conversation with researchers, have open conversation. I know we have, I know we have the GDP guidelines, which are very, very, very clear about you know what community and stakeholder engagement should look like. Yet we know that these guidelines to date they continue to be inconsistently and completely applied. I also just want to talk about tension. Right? I know as communities and industry, you know, partners, we may not always agree on everything. Right? So tension, you know, is inevitable. Right? So, but the good thing is that those tensions can be addressed through having candid and meaningful conversation. I think COVID, as Rita Kerobeka was saying, has taught us some important, important lessons, especially import, uh, important lessons around, important, uh, around involving communities at each and every stage of research and development. We've been hearing a lot about vaccine hesitancy, and maybe it could be because we did not engage communities enough right at the beginning when these trials were being conceptualized, uh, planned, even during implementation. Right? So we need to learn from that and make sure that we are building trust with communities. But right? as communities, we are always eager to listen and learn with keen interest the challenges and the struggles that you know industry partners and researchers face, and to work together to find solutions to address these uh, challenges. Another important lesson from uh, COVID that we have learned from COVID is that the lack of equity can derail progress in fighting a pandemic. And I think Linda just touched on the health system component. We have seen how low-income countries were left behind whilst the rest of the world were benefiting from the COVID vaccine discovery, which actually widened the gap between the rich and the, and the poor. And we saw how that vaccine equity ended up jeopardizing the safety for everyone and actually leaks uh, prolonging the pandemic as we are seeing now. And we know, of course, there are further implications to that, including the slowing down of the economic recovery that we are seeing, the impact on the global labor markets, public debt payments, but also the country's ability to prioritize on other priorities. So, and we, and we, did, we need to actually learn from these mistakes, which is why I think as we are moving into this next phase of vaccine discovery, as we are thinking about the different you know, vaccine trial designs, as we are thinking about the vaccine candidates and the delivery mechanism, we need to make sure that we are taking equity into consideration. We know that HIV vaccine enterprise has been the engine for COVID vaccine discovery. It has, been, it has tremendously helped to discover multiple COVID vaccine candidates. And we need to invest, as Cinder Gilbega said, the same energy commitment, coordination, partnership, and resources into this new phase of vaccine discovery, investing in building as well as expanding the manufacturing capacity on the African continent especially, will actually also help to address the equity challenge that I, I just talked about. Lastly, but not least, once we have an effective vaccine on the market, we need all of us that we are in this meeting together to work together to make sure that you know, that vaccine is accessible and affordable to those who need them, especially those communities that contributed to the research. HIV remains an important public health problem. As we heard on Wednesday during the launch of the UNAIDS uh, report, the AIDS response is in danger. I think as a committee representative, I'm proud of all the successes and the scientific breakthroughs we have seen. I'm excited about the wide range of the treatment and prevention options that are available on the market, which are bringing us closer you know, to ending this pandemic. But we also know that for 
an effective HIV vaccine will actually bring us even closer to ending this pandemic as it will help us to address some of the access gaps and challenges that we are currently experiencing with the tools that we have uh, today. Thank you so much and wishing you all a great meeting. Great, thank you Maureen for, for your comments and your insights in the talk. I, I fully agree that you know, we can see what has happened. I mean, you know, if we don't engage a community early, you're not gonna develop that trust. And we've seen what happened with you know, the mistrust, misinformation with all the COVID vaccines and such large populations not even wanting to get that vaccine. So building that trust from the very beginning and involving the community in the research so, um, to build that uh, is, is very important. So next, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dan Baruch, who's principal investigator of his laboratory at the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where he is also professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And he'll be talking about what does a successful public-private partnership for HIV vaccine R&D look like? Um, so, so thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this important session. Also the prior speakers for reigniting our passion in HIV vaccines and uh, discussing the importance of community. I've been asked to talk about what a successful public-private partnership uh, for HIV vaccine R&D would look like. And of course, there's no way that I can uh, generalize an answer to that because uh, there's many different structures for uh, public-private partnership, but I'm happy to share some of our own experiences in bringing an HIV vaccine concept from, con from, from, from initial concept all the way through efficacy trials. And this is essentially our collaboration with uh, J&J Janssen in the uh, recent Ad26 uh, Mosaic uh, HIV vaccine candidate. And although this vaccine in the uh, phase 2b Imbicoda study was not shown to be successful, we did get a clear answer and the partnership was successful. And so uh, hopefully uh, this can be, as uh, Linda Gale mentioned, an, an example of uh, how perhaps a partnership, I'm not sure I would call it a magical partnership, but certainly a very effective partnership uh, might, might be able to be replicated by ourselves and others moving forward. So briefly, to summarize our collaboration, uh, sort of maybe a behind the scenes look, I'm not going to show any data slides today, but uh, this essentially was an academic or still is an academic industry partnership, initially with our research laboratory at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and a small biotechnology in Holland called Crucel. The initial funding for our partnership was an NIH grant that was a U19 grant called an IPCAVD or Integrated Preclinical Clinical AIDS Vaccine Development Program grant, which specifically engaged both academia and industry on an HIV vaccine topic. If it were not for this program that essentially brought together uh, academia and industry, then I don't think that this vaccine concept would really have been born in the first place. It was actually the first project in my lab many years ago uh, to, to develop a novel adenoviral vectors, given the limitations that were seen with the AD5 vector used by the Merck and the NIH vaccine center programs at that time. And we selected AD26 as a vector for development. We also collaborated with another academic laboratory, Betty Korber's laboratory at Los Alamos, to develop mosaic antigens for improved global coverage. In 2011, our collaboration took a different turn when the small biotech company Crucel was purchased by a large pharmaceutical company called Johnson & Johnson. And now with a large pharmaceutical company as a partner, development was accelerated in terms of manufacturing and clinical trials. And this then led to the collaboration with the HVTN, the HIV Vaccine Trials Network for the Phase 2B in Bokoto and the Phase 3 Mosaico studies. Last year, as uh, I presume you know, the Imbicoto results showed a trend, but not a significant degree of efficacy, certainly not enough for advancement. And the phase three mosaico study in a different population with a slightly different vaccine is still ongoing. So what were the elements of what I think is a successful collaboration? First and foremost, we had an aligned scientific goal, which was to develop an HIV vaccine that upfront was developed as a vaccine that could be cheap, affordable, thermostable, and deliverable to the developing world. Another key element for the successful collaboration was mutual respect and complementary expertise amongst the researchers. Innovation preclinical and immunology was really the 
the, um, uh, the expertise of the academic partners, which were Beth Israel, Deaconess Medical Center, Los Alamos, and the Reagan Institute. And manufacturing, regulatory, and development was really the expertise of uh, Janssen within Johnson & Johnson. And then the large-scale clinical trials was really a partnership between uh, J&J and the NIH-sponsored HIV Vaccine Trials Network. The collaboration also evolved over time. It was a very different collaboration as an early phase collaboration with a small biotech company versus a development focused collaboration with a large pharmaceutical company. And essentially we moved the, the, the initial part of our collaboration was uh, small uh, 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 vaccine studies in mice and eventually resulted in large scale uh, field efficacy trials. So what were the biggest challenges along the way? And like any partnership, uh, even the most successful ones, there of course are challenges. And I think a successful partnership is not avoiding these challenges, but really figuring out how to solve and work through these challenges. And working through, and what we did is we were able to work through differences of opinion about the direction of the collaboration as the field naturally shifted and grew over time. And solutions require trust and respect, open discussion, acknowledging each other's opinions and coming to mutually agreeable solutions. I think in our case, what really facilitated this was long-term collaborations over many years with the same individuals. Uh, and so just a couple of very quick examples uh, to, to, to address the challenge of viral diversity, we talked about many different possible solutions and eventually collaborated with Betty Korber to develop uh, bivalent envelope and gag palm mosaic immunogens. Follow, a second example is following the disappointing results of the Merck STEP study, then we really invested in trying to understand biological differences amongst ad serotypes. And also clinically implementing safety features in the protocol, such as early stopping rules, if there were safety events, we'd want to know about them right away. Fortunately, uh, the, the efficacy trials have progressed very well and have not shown any uh, enhancement of infection. And then following the, uh, the, the, the interesting results from the RV144 tie trial, we decided eventually to add a protein boost to the ad vector vaccine regimen. I think it's also worth noting that the HIV vaccine partnership has led to other uh, research partnerships that really would not have happened without the HIV. And specifically, I'm talking with the development of, of one of the uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccines. In January of 2020, uh, uh, our existing collaboration with Janssen has, what was expanded or adapted to include the development of an ad 26 based COVID vaccine. We signed a collaboration agreement with uh, j and &J in four days, which is pretty unheard of, I think. And given the uh, given the partnership, the nature of the partnership, the focus on the developing world, and also the intrinsic thermostability of the vaccine platform, uh, it was decided up front that this would be a nonprofit vaccine to be given at cost throughout the world. It, uh, the J&J &J COVID vaccine was the third vaccine uh, approved under an EUA in the United States. Uh, is given to uh, more than 17 or 18 million people in the United States. And although the use in the US and the EU is limited due to a very rare but potentially serious side effect of thrombosis, then it is, uh, this condition appears to be potentially less um, frequent in the developing world and remains a first line vaccine in much of the developing world. In fact, this vaccine was the first vaccine to be rolled out in South Africa. I think the first vaccine on the entire African continent and was used to protect uh, the majority of healthcare workers in South Africa in a massive rollout in February of last year, led by um, many, many investigators who are also our partners in the HIV vaccine effort. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Linda Gale Becker, who's the chair of the session, Dr. Glenda Gray, and many of their partners. And so not only is the, not only did the um, HIV vaccine technologies and industry partners and academic groups contribute to the COVID vaccine, but also the clinical investigator teams actually contributed. Overall, uh, approximately 200 million vaccine doses have been administered and it's estimated that close to a million lives were saved by this vaccine alone. And this is, of course, a direct result of the HIV vaccine program. So how about HIV vaccine partnerships for the future? Um, uh, right now, the field is uh, largely back to a discovery stage. And apart from Mosaico, uh, I, I'm not aware of any other HIV vaccines that are currently or planned for imminently, imminent efficacy field trials. 
But we, we remain optimistic given the advances of the field. And the future of the field requires research partnerships between academia and industry, as well as a rigorous decision-making process to decide what to advance into efficacy trials moving forward. But there is a critical need for industry. I think we all will agree on that. And academia alone cannot bring a vaccine to market. So um, I wouldn't be so bold as to tell you what the keys the, the, the key to a successful partnership is. But what I would say is that at least in my opinion and experience, early engagement of the industry partner is really important so that they are scientifically invested in the program willing to take risks, as well as the development of a respectful shared decision-making process and long-term relationships, not only between academia and industry, but also government, uh, community stakeholders, and all the other uh, groups that are needed for a successful holistic partnership. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions uh, during the panel discussion. Thank, thanks so much, Dan. I think that really was um, spot on. Uh, I think um, some of those keys really pointing out, and I would go so far as to say that, you know, I think there's some magic in those synergies, um, not only synergies in terms of pathogens that we had to deal with um, and the very elegant pivot to, to the crisis of the day, but also just the synergies that were exploited between, as you say, the various expertise that was brought to bear by the partners. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, and thank you for sticking around and Maureen too uh, for the panel discussion in a moment. So my pleasure now uh, to hand over to Birgit Poniatowski, who I'm sure you all know is uh, the IAS Executive Director and who is responsible for this gig um, here. So together with her, her uh, fantastic team have put IAS 2022 together for us and, and really should be congratulated. But um, on top of all of that, the IAS also has a number of very exciting projects. And I know the HIV Vaccine Enterprise uh, is one of those. Um, and I, it's my pleasure to hand over to Birgit to tell you what's happening there um, and the industry partnership in particular. Birgit. Thank you, Linda Gale. Thank you, Linda Gale, for the very kind uh, in introduction. Yes, and please continue enjoying the gig. <laughs> um, The IAS has a long history of collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry uh, with which we engage in three major ways. One is as donors, where industry um, supports our research, promotion, and educational activities. Another way is as sponsors, for example, of a conference such as this here, where industry helps us bring the many different stakeholders together um, that need to work together to end the epidemic. And thirdly, as partners in some of our technical working groups, our convenings, and other cooperations, which we organize to share knowledge and to develop new ideas. The biopharmaceutical industry has a key role to play in the HIV response. Has a key role to play in the, um, uh, in the HIV response. Maximizing its contribution is necessary to ensure comprehensive, coordinated, and an effective response to the HIV epidemic. Now, the IAS Corporate Partnership Program aims to engage industry and non-industry partners in a dialogue toward addressing topical issues, with IAS acting as a neutral convener. The concept of the Corporate Partnership Program focuses on timely and topical issues as informed by its members. For example, right now we are working on long-acting formulations and uh, their delivery systems and on accelerating approval of diagnostic tools. Using its tried and tested framework and approach, we are growing the corporate partnership program and aligning our strategic engagement with industry in two focus areas which are um, the CURE group, which supports industry and non-industry collaboration in HIV CURE research and development, and a vaccine group to provide a forum to facilitate and optimize the biomedical industry's engagement in HIV vaccine R&D. The activities of each group are steered by its members and two co-chairs, 
one from industry and one to represent non-industry members, as we have here on the stage with us. Over the years, we had a variety of partners take part in this program already, as you can see on the slide here. The Industry Liaison, Liaison Forum, which is the precursor of the current corporate partnership program, supported a number of uh, important initiatives over the years. And I'm just giving you a couple of examples here. For example, uh, the development of the GAPF, which is now hosted by WHO. In another example, we published manufacturers' perspectives on the WHO pre-qualification process. We've organized a number of satellite sessions at the IAS Science Conference last year and also this year. Please have a look at the conference program and you'll find some exciting uh, satellite topics that come out of our conversations with industry um, featured in the program here. This year, we hosted a series of webinars on experimental medicine for preventative HIV vaccines. Again, engaging scientists, clinicians, industry, funders, and importantly, community, as Maureen has pointed out earlier. And we had uh, speakers from Moderna and Vera Biotechnology involved in these discussions. Now, moving forward, we want to expand our activities with industry partners in a changing prevention, treatment, and care landscape. For this, we will apply the successful approach to industry engagement from the Industry Liaison Forum and towards the an HIV cure industry group to an HIV vaccine industry partnership. Our goal for this partnership is to revive and maximize interest, engagement, and investment, obviously, of the biopharmaceutical industry in HIV vaccine R&D. We are therefore creating this neutral, multi-stakeholder platform for industry and non-industry. And for us, that's important to have both, both sides of the coin working together uh, in the partnership, which we hope will provide the foundation and environment for reigniting this interest in the search for an HIV vaccine. Now, as we all know, the HIV vaccine research field is again at a turning point with two efficacy trials that were discontinued over the past 18 months. So the field is pretty much back to a discovery stage with a rich pipeline of new products that are entering early clinical testing. Meanwhile, and despite tremendous progress with other HIV prevention tools, as Linda Gale so, so very pointedly uh, um, spoke about earlier, the HIV epidemic remains unabated and issues of access to new prevention tools, but also of users' preferences point to a continued need for an effective prophylactic HIV vaccine as part of a multimodal response. Now that we are re recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic, the response to which has benefited from 40 years of HIV uh, research, of course, it is a good time to re-engage with industry by addressing and minimizing the barriers to industry engagement in vaccine R&D. We are launching this new initiative with a renewed awareness of the barriers to industry engagement, but also with mechanisms to support overcoming these barriers. Working with industry and non-industry stakeholders, we have identified the push and pull mechanisms, which we believe will strengthen this industry engagement. These mechanisms cover all stages of product development from start to end and also ways of working and funding strategies. From promoting entrepreneurship to creative innovative funding mechanisms while creating demand and preparing for success. The Enterprise Vaccine Industry Partnership aims to push and pull at the various stages in the development of an HIV vaccine. We've already identified a number of areas where members could work together to address potential teething issues. Again, whatever we do will be informed by members with the aim to deliver tangible outcomes. 
For example, there's a strong interest in new technologies for vaccines and how to test them in clinical trials in the context of PrEP, of course. The enterprise has already contributed to this area with a series of webinars in 2021 on clinical trials and more work is needed. During this conference, two satellites will discuss these issues that you will again find in your conference program. And we strongly encourage you to attend. But obviously, and Maureen couldn't have said it any better, we also need to engage with communities <clears throat> and, add up and better understand their prevention needs as this is critical for product development. Our ways of working will be informed by the success of the IIS Industry Liaison Forum by providing a neutral space for interactions between industry and non-industry members. We expect other benefits for both industry and non-industry members, including an increased visibility and better understanding of academic vaccine R&D and a facilitated engagement with community-based organizations. This will also be an opportunity for members to share information and initiate new partnerships. That's what it's all about. So, in closing, overall, with the IAS Corporate Partnership Program Vaccine Industry Partnership, and we'll come up with a way to say this a bit more briefly, um, we aim to add value to all stages of product development. And with that, I'm now pleased to hand back over to Linda Gale and Carrie for our panel discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Brigitte, for your leadership and the IS's uh, leadership in this role and facilitating these interactions and collaborations because you know nobody can do it alone uh, trying to solve these issues. And you know, I've been part of the, the Cure Industry Collaborative Group and seen how your group has brought together different stakeholders that probably would not have talked together uh, and, and bringing that together to, to move the science and the field forward. So thank you for your, your leadership on this. So it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists uh, uh, for the rest of this session. So Shan Liu, uh, who is here, at, uh, he is professor with tenure and director of Laboratory of uh, Nucleic Acid Vaccines in the Department of Medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester. Uh, we have already met uh, Maureen Luba, who's the Senior Program Manager uh, for Global Advocacy for HIV Prevention, or AVAC. Uh, we have uh, Jan van Lunzen, Head of Translational Medical Research at Vive Healthcare. Uh, we also have Valerie Oriol Matu, uh, Global Medical Affairs Leader and vaccines at Janssen Vaccines and Prevention. And we also have uh, Birgit Hanatowski, uh, who you just heard from, as well as Dan Baruch, uh, who is uh, virtual on, on this panel. Thanks, Kerry. And so that um, really, I think, you know, sets us up for an interesting panel discussion. So I'm going to remind you all to get your questions ready. Come forward to the mics if you're in the room. And I'll remind uh, our delegates online to please post your questions in the Q&A. Carrie and I, the reason we're developing this sort of crick in the neck is that we, we have the questions here just on the side. So we'll be monitoring those um, and look forward to hearing some questions from you. Um, just to, again, reiterate the, the power of partnerships. And I think what we've seen in the last two years gives us great sort of hope and um, an enthusiasm for pursuing uh, with this opportunity to bring many players together. But also, now we really need to act on that momentum and say, how do we emulate that and bring that into HIV? It really feels very urgent to do this. And I, I want to reflect there was another way that the industry liaison worked incredibly hard and was very successful, and that was around pediatric formulation, subject very close to my heart. Um, and I can truly say that I think the Liaison Forum was instrumental in accelerating uh, new formulations for children. Um, so these are, you know, these unmet needs uh, that really can be accelerated by convening unlikely people in the room um, to make sure that they have a safe place uh, to do this. So. Um, 
Yes, so please scan this QR code to join the virtual Q&A and poll for this session and, um, and well, we'll be definitely receiving your questions. Um, and I think I'm going to hand over to Carrie for the first question and we'll take it from there. Sure, thank you, Linda Gale. So for the panel, uh, you know, what are the critical challenges, you know, your top two challenges uh, presented by HIV vaccine development for the pharmaceutical industry that would need to be addressed uh, with the highest priority? Uh, maybe we can start with Valerie. Yes, thank you. So before I respond to your question, I would like first uh, to thank IAS for organizing uh, this panel and uh, this meeting, but uh, also for being very perseverant with uh, the global HIV enterprise uh, and for supporting these partnerships. Um, in the experience of, uh, of Jensen, these partnerships have been really instrumental um, and we won't be where we are today without the partners, exactly as Dan Barrock said previously. So for your question, uh, the two main barriers. So Today, I think uh, we need many, many vaccine candidates uh, because HIV is an extremely difficult uh, virus, an extremely difficult target, and there has been um, a lot of disappointment in the development of HIV vaccines. Uh, so the only thing we know is that it won't be easy. Uh, so I think um, our best chance to have uh, a new, an HIV vaccine which is effective and which is brought to the market in the coming years is having many, many candidates. And in the past years, what we have seen is that there were not so many companies pursuing late development of vaccines, unfortunately. So if it would be many of us, there would be more chances to have one or two succeeding. Um, and the barriers are at many different levels. They are the pure scientific barriers, but they are also barriers in uh, conducting the clinical trials. Uh, we need uh, to organize extremely large clinical trials uh, that are extremely risky, extremely costly, and uh, difficult also to organize in practice. Uh, for example, in uh, many places, um, the incidence of HIV is not very high. So because of that, your trial is large and um, you also have other prevention measures. So you need to show what your vaccine can bring on the top of existing prevention measures. So it's a complex environment. Um, maybe I will stop here because I think I have already mentioned several bias. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, Jan, do you want to? Yeah, thank you. And <coughs> again, I uh, also like to congratulate you for, you know, this initiative. And I think this is a very crucial moment uh, following the momentum which uh, COVID vaccine development has given to us. There are certainly a lot of similarities, but there is also a lot of differences. And, and maybe we, um, we may want to uh, address this. And, and before I go to kind of, you know, address the, the challenges from my perspective, I would like to make a, a bold statement uh, up front, and that is I'm absolutely convinced that now no infectious disease ever has been eradicated without a vaccine, and that will also continue to be true. It is true for HIV. It is true for SARS-CoV-2. It is true for other infectious diseases as well. So that is, if you are committed to developing HIV drugs, you should be committed also uh, to develop HIV vaccines, be it therapeutic, be it preventive. Now, having said that, I think my two major challenges from an industry perspective is, number one is commitment, and number two is implementation. So, number one, commitment. Commitment, especially from our side as the industry, uh, we as pharmaceutical companies are, uh, you know, driven by shareholders. Uh, we have to earn money, let's be honest. We have to make investments. Uh, some of the um, research which we are doing and the developments which we are doing have a direct effect um, on uh, stock prices, market shares, etc. And this is something which actually uh, is something which we have to take into the equation. And I think that it contributes a lot to the risk advertedness, especially of large pharma 
companies. And I, I really have to congratulate my colleagues from Janssen. Uh, what they have done and what as, uh, others have done is, is, is not normal. You know, they, they do take a risk. And then there, there is that commitment, which I think is needed from all of the companies which are involved in HIV drug development to also commit to um, go into vaccine development and not just rely on antiretroviral therapy as it is for today. And I think there, there is a, 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 an understanding or notion uh, which I hear very often, and that is you can't earn money you know, with developing an HIV vaccine. I think this is a, perhaps a, a notion which I would not completely subscribe to, but it is not only that you, it's not about, you know, earning money, but it's about, you know, something to lose. And the losing is, what we can lose is our reputation, we can lose trust as companies who are involved in, in the field. And I think that is something which should drive us as uh, the pharmaceutical companies involved in the HIV field to really be committed to HIV um, vaccine development uh, moving forward. The number two is the implementation part. I keep that a little shorter, but I think you have rightly said, you know, we are facing um, also from the trial designs and the, the, the mere size of the trials, considerable challenges. And, and one of the things which uh, has recently been added to that is is prep and the, and the success of prep. I mean, you know, we we're, we're facing now uh, a situation where we can really very effectively prevent uh, you know infections, especially in high incident uh, settings, and and we have to take that into account. And um, having said that, I think from my perspective, what what is badly needed is to develop uh, better biomarkers, uh, which are you know capable of uh, not. Um, putting people at, at, at unnecessary risk, but you know, f uh, which can serve us as, um, you know, not um, getting people infected as a readout, but you know, having a biomarker in hand which is uh, which is capable of uh, translating an immune response into a meaningful uh, potential clinical outcome. So I'll stop there, and these are just a few, uh, you know thoughts I have around this. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Jan. And maybe just a couple comments from Sean and Dan, just because of their, you know, they've collaborated with industry before. So maybe, Sean, you can uh, start. Sure. Uh, I'll be very happy. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I come here, actually have a dual role. Uh, not only I have been a professor at UMass Medical School. Uh, my background, I started HIV vaccine while I was a postdoc 30 years ago. I was one of the first groups started DNA vaccine uh, with my mentor, Harry Robinson. We also did the mRNA vaccine, by the way, at that time. Uh, now, the today I'm here, actually, uh, the company, WHV, the logo, is a member of this new partnership. And also, the WHV standing for Worcester HIV vaccine. Worcester is the city of UMass Medical School and then we want to recognize contribution from university. This company was formed based on the licensure of my HIV vaccine developed from my laboratory into this company. So I guess I would say this is the only vaccine right, a company right now in the world dedicated to HIV. That's dangerous. This is system failure. We need to have more industry companies to dedicate to do that. If you ask me what is the two top problem from my background, from a professor now going to develop vaccine, I think there are two things. One, we have a huge disconnection between basic science and the product development. The second one is most HIV vaccine research are done in North America, even Europe, not that much. And then the disconnection between the science early study in the later final study in where people need the most, Africa. So the gap between the early phase basic study to the more efficacy signal study is not connected. I think this needs to be changed. I do not personally believe that experimented medicine, that's just another way of doing mouse experiment. We need to test sign any signal, because almost in history, 30 years, HIV vaccine, every time we predict some outcome of efficacy, the result always the opposite. 
I think we should learn that. So this is the two barriers, I think. I can talk more later. Also, I want to add that. What is the solution for this? My solution is a biotech. You know, in nowadays, biomedical device, there's a pharmaceutical. Why in the last 30 years we have a biotech? The reality, the, my colleagues from big industry will tell you, they become less and less capable of developing a new drug or vaccine or anything. They got from biotech. Look, mRNA vaccine, who developed that? Bionet and Pfizer took it. And the Moderna, right? That's a good example. So I think that this is something we need to think about. If we have more people, biotech has a less risk, less financial risk, like my colleague just mentioned. I don't blame big pharmaceutical company. They should not be doing this kind of very costly, expensive investment. The whole society, we should in encourage more biotech risk-taking project. And then once we have a lead, attractive pharmaceutical can work with them, like a dance case. So I will stop here. Think maybe well. Let's ask Dan. Dan's there, so let's let's get Dan. Yeah, Dan. From your experience working, you know, from an academic and and working with companies, what are the two critical challenges that you see that need to be overcome? Well, first, I um, I completely agree with everything that's been said uh, in many different areas and facets. Uh, I guess I would just highlight. A couple things. Uh, you asked for two. So let me just try to pick two things to highlight. The first one is the need for diversity. We don't have a clear path towards an HIV vaccine yet. Uh, it was quite clear paths that would likely be successful for COVID-19. We don't have a linear path. It's not, it's not a simple linear path for HIV. And so therefore, the best chance for ultimate success, as I think Valerie said earlier, is to make sure that we have a diversity of approaches. I'm concerned about that right now because we don't have a lot of diversity of approaches. And I would like to see more, a greater diversity of HIV vaccine approaches uh, being put forth by the field. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, there needs to be more incentives for industry to participate in the HIV vaccine process as has been highlighted by other speakers. Uh, I agree with Shan Lu's comments and uh, the other panelists' comments, uh, but I think that even, even with the current uh, incentives, then uh, many uh, industry partners uh, are reluctant to, um, to, to, to seriously get into the HIV vaccine field given the scientific risks and potentially uh, uh, less than dramatic um, uh, profits at the end. So there needs to be other mechanisms, uh, such as in our case was an NIH funding mechanism that brought academia and industry together. And there are other possible mechanisms too. So I think uh, I'll stop there and happy to uh, take any questions. Thanks, Dan. So that's great. So Dan uh, and Maureen, just so you guys know, I know it's hard when you're sitting looking at the screen. We do have some questions in the room and we have a couple on on uh, on the screen as well. But let's move to the room. I think m maybe in the interest of time, we'll take... Um, all three of you, if you could just uh, say who you're directing it to, and then I'll ask the panelists just to remember your questions as they come. Hello, everyone. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yep. So my name is Louis Shackleford. I'm an external relations project manager at the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. Um, I'm not really asking this question or making these comments out of my role at the network. But as I'm listening to this conversation, just a few things come up. Um, I'm glad that implementation was mentioned. You know, as, as long as researchers like Linda Gale Becker take breath, I feel like I feel very confident that we'll get to an HIV vaccine at some point. Um, what concerns me, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, is implementation. And two things in particular you know, community capacity to understand what our vaccine is, what it does, how it works, um, particularly in a setting where the predominant view of vaccines is that we give people a virus or we give people an infectious agent 
to help protect them from that same agent. Um, so that's one of the things that I would like to see us focus on as we focus on the scientific development piece is building community capacity to understand this vaccine so that when we roll it out, we're not fighting for the next uh, 10, 20 years for people to just have confidence and trust in taking it. And so, and then the other piece of it is I really don't want to see, you know, the richest countries buy up all the vaccines um, and leave the less rich countries out in the cold. Um, I think that's something that came to light throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And it is real, it's a real travesty, you know, so thinking about how we can distribute vaccines worldwide in an equitable fashion is something that I would like us to consider as we move forward uh, with development. Thank you for that. And I think those are brilliant comments that maybe when we come and if people want to comment specifically, please keep that in mind. Otherwise, we'll keep... Thank you for terrific comments. Then again, may I, yes. may I just briefly yes, comment Jan. directly on, on that? Yeah. And I, I just would like to, <clears throat> to say it is... And I, I fully, fully agree with you. We have, even in the absence of any viable vaccine you know, on the horizon... We have to get ready now for success. And that is a lesson which we have learned also from COVID, right? Because, you know, that exactly what you're saying is, you know, we have to build trust and trust building measures are different in different parts of the world. One thing which is truly helpful is early community, uh, community engagement. There is nothing like one size fits all. We have to address different cultural and socioeconomic, et cetera, backgrounds. But we also have to make sure that these vaccines, and this is also a trust-building component in my mind, are manufactured in countries which are hardest hit, for instance, right? You know, we know that India is now one of the biggest, if not the biggest, I think, you know, vaccine uh, producer in the world. Why shouldn't that happen in South Africa? Why shouldn't that happen in, in other resource-limited settings? I don't, I don't see a reason why that should not be the case, right? It is challenging, yes, that especially generic companies making a vaccine, if one would be available one day, is, it's harder to make than a small molecule. Yeah, I admit that. But again, we have to get ready now for that. And I, I think you're, you're pointing at a, at, a, at a very, very important point uh, which we have to address right in time, and it, it's the right time now, even without having a vaccine in hand. And let me end with a quote uh, about implementation, and that comes from... Our, our friend, our late uh, Job Lange, who once said, you know, wherever I came in Africa, I got a cold Coke. Why shouldn't it be possible, even with a cold chain, to get a vaccine to bring brought to the people? And I, I think this is the best quote, you know, which is exemplifying what, what we have to do to get ready for that. It is just a, uh, the, 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 the willingness and the commitment to do so. If you can get a, a cold Coke, you can get a vaccine anywhere in the world. Amen. Thanks, Ian. Hi, um, uh, my name is Ryan Yuka. I'm a graduate student at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle, Washington. Um, this is actually a really good segue into my question. Um, obviously, there, this is all in the backdrop of the COVID-19 vaccines, um, as it's been mentioned before. And it's also important, obviously, it's been mentioned to build trust with communities. But I also am kind of wondering about the trust between the partnership between the industry and the academic partners. Because one lesson that I think that hasn't really been brought up as much today um, that was quite important from the COVID-19 rollout, vaccine rollout, was that a lot of public, um, publicly funded research that went into mRNA vaccines um, that was used to design vaccines by, say, Moderna, Pfizer, they took that publicly funded research, patented it, and then made a lot, a lot of money off of it, and then refused to waive the patents so that a large parts of um, lower income countries were unable to have access to the vaccines, which was, a, again, a part of a, many reasons why we're having continued waves of resistant um, viruses. And so I was wondering how we avoid making a deal with the devil, per se, of having these seemingly good faith uh, uh, partnerships with industry, um, helping to develop these vaccines together, and then they go actually, once it's all ready, 
kind of seen with, with AstraZeneca. They developed the vaccine, and then even formerly benevolent actors, Bill Gates, went ahead and encouraged them to not waive that patent, and then they didn't. So how, are, how do we trust our industry partners to work in good faith with us to once we actually develop these vaccines that they're not just going to turn around, patent it, make sure that only people kind of like you were saying, US, Canada, Europe gets it, and then all the um, India, Brazil, South Africa, Cuba, they can't get it because the patents aren't waived. So how do we build that trust between the academic um, research and the industry research? So I'm starting to hear some some tricky questions and I uh, hope the panel are ready for this. Uh, we're going to ask one more um, and then perhaps people can volunteer to, to pick up those because we may not be able to hear from everybody. Do you want to go already uh, then? I can try that. Mm -hmm. I think what you are asking mainly as we learn big pharmaceutical companies, I think we have to understand when they start, they don't really think it just make money because invest a huge amount of facility, phase three, quality, standard control, everything is very costly. Uh, but on the other hand, I think we should build a mechanism right now because right now there's a ho no hope for HIV vaccine. We can build a commercial or marketing mechanism. That is, if I support you, later you will surrender certain right. For example, uh, my vaccine, this is not my, but it's my vaccine to move forward. I will be very happy supporting my investor, saying if the society, whether the Gates Foundation or NIH, think they support it, because right now nobody gives you money to move forward, right? Well, for example, our vaccine have a great data, phase one, probably best in 30 years, but very hard to move phase two or three. So if someone gives you money, we'll be willing to exchange something. I think we can do that. Why not? Right? So we should use the modern market economic mechanism to do that. Then everything will be fair. That's my suggestion. Sorry. I don't know if anyone else has a burning uh, comment to make to that statement. Valerie? No. Yes, no. I can comment on the side of uh, the confidence in partnership. I would like to, to say that even if we had a very positive experience of partnerships, uh, each partnership is an adventure. And uh, it's a lot of effort to understand each other because as you expressed that, uh, we come with uh, different goals and we come also with uh, different cultures, different mindsets. Uh, so it's a lot of effort to work in partnerships. Uh, and even if we have been able in our example to make it working for many, many years, uh, it always uh, needs a lot of discussion and a lot of diplomacy and a lot of efforts. Uh, and we have to, to recognize uh, our, our differences. And for, for the topic you, that you, you mentioned about patents, I think it has to be approached with um, uh, a, a lot of a lot of details and a lot of precautions because uh, there is also a lot of investment from industry and it has to remain something attractive. Thank you. So this could be part of the uh, the work of this new partnership. I did not comment possibly like my panelists. I really think this IAS established corporate partnership is so wonderful. Because I, from my personal experience, I feel this is a way much needed, especially this perfect time. So all these things uh, you can add into this mission of the partnership, we can consider that. I just want to comment, you know, so use the example in COVID, some company made a lot of money, mm -hmm. but some company, including big company, I'm not sure Jensen how much money or they may never going to make money. So we need to be fair and equal maybe we should generate some public trust or something to use that mechanism, a pool of money. Uh, so this may be the things the partnership should discuss, develop. Yeah, I love the idea of a new way of doing business, which may be terrific. You've waited a long time. Thank you for your patience. Um, can you hear me? Um, so my name is Jessica Andreessen. I am also part of this Seattle-based uh, HIV vaccine trials network clan, but like Lewis said, I'm not representing the HVTN. Um, I'm not going to tell on you. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm not afraid of Larry. It's fine. Um, the thing I wanted to pose to this panel and maybe to the society, particularly to the enterprise, is a thing that actually has been plaguing our trials 
and something that we've had to make our industry partners aware of long before PrEP, and that is vaccine-induced seropositivity or seroreactivity. So when our vaccines work, they generate antibodies. We know that these antibodies are needed and powerful, and some of the antibodies also can cross-react with diagnostics. And so I think my question at a high level is, how are we going to deal with that? Because if we get to the rollout stage, it's too late. Like you were saying, now is the time. And one could almost make the argument that had our efficacy trials been successful, we're behind because we don't have the ability to roll out a vaccine without the understanding of this, without the testing or the ability to interpret the current tests. Or I love what Maureen said about asking the community, OK, let's present this problem. How are we going to solve it? We have time now. And I would wonder if the society or the enterprise has taken that into account in planning, because I think this is a good forum for that. Thanks, Jessica. So I think Valerie would like to respond to that, and maybe Maureen and Birgit. So I, I fully agree with you. It's it's a something uh, something crucial, absolutely crucial. And um, actually, I invite you to uh, look at a poster. Um, about a new uh, potential targets for HIV diagnostic. It's clear that um, the rollout of new HIV diagnostics that are insensitive to the antibodies that are triggered by a vaccine has uh, really uh, is really necessary at the time at the same time than the rollout of a vaccine, and both have to go together or uh, vaccine implementation won't be successful. So I don't know how many years we have still before an HIV vaccine. Uh, so because we are very, very conscious of that, uh, we have actually um, identified uh, some antigen targets that could be the basis of a, of a diagnostic. We have done only some early steps of research, and uh, then this type of thing has to be uh, moved uh, forward by by uh, diagnostic companies. And that's going to be critical. Um, I worry about that because this kind of altering the testing and making it able to distinguish between vaccine antibodies and infection antibodies, great. That is always the answer that I get from clinicians and molecular developers. But then the rollout and the equity and all it takes is a small number of people who are using the wrong test mm -hmm. while we try to roll this out to derail all of the work of everyone in this industry. And so how many prongs do we need mm -hmm. to solve this problem? The testing is absolutely one of them. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's awesome. So and, and I wonder if, Jess, if um, Maureen has some thoughts about that. Maureen, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know you're an expert. So what do you think? So unfortunately, I'm having a hard time to hear you all because uh, you keep cutting. In. Yeah, so I, I actually missed uh, the first part oh, of the so question. Sorry. <laughs> so, 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 Maureen, I don't know if you, it's thought about, it's, it's about um, vaccine-induced seropositivity uh, and just the need to be educating communities about what that means prior to having a successful vaccine and all the issues. Uh, Valerie very kindly sort of put forward the idea of new diagnostics, uh, but Jessica, uh, who's here from the VT and also, you know, brings it back again to say that in itself may not be sufficient, although necessary. Any thoughts? Yeah, so I think I'll just go back to what I said, um, uh, I think on uh, the need to invest in um, I think research literacy and um, educating communities, um, because I think, like I said in, in my talk, um, I think it's very important uh, to make sure that communities do, especially when you talk about uh, when you talk about um, uh, vaccine induced positivity. I think that's what you said. I think it's important to make sure that communities, you know, really do understand what we mean by by that. But that will take a lot of investment. That will take, you know, a commitment uh, from the from the industry partners, from the researchers, making sure that it's a priority, right? And I think as the the research advances, I hope I've responded uh, to the question. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen and Bigot. You had a few Maybe. thoughts, and then I'm handing back to Carrie. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be very brief because I mainly want to thank you all because we've got the agendas for the next few meetings of the vaccine uh, industry partnership set. And, and the reason you don't see me taking notes is that 
gladly I have some colleagues in the audience who are. So uh, we will be coming back to, to all these and, and discuss with our, our members uh, together how we prioritize what we need to focus on first. What I would also like to say is that the vaccine industry partnership doesn't exist in isolation within the IAS. Um, we have many other activities, uh, specifically on vaccines or beyond, that we can connect the discussions within the industry partnership to. I mean, we just just a couple of hours ago, uh, we had a nice get together with um, mentors and mentees from our um, uh, global vaccine enterprise program, all based in Africa. Um, they're, they're, these are all excellent uh, people, established emerging scientists based in Africa, and I'm sure uh, uh, of interest for, for, for some of you to, to connect with. And, uh, um, we've worked with the medicines patent pool in, in other contexts, yeah, and as you are talking about uh, licensing, etc., I think uh, those uh, they will be interesting partners in those discussions as well. So just to say, uh, yeah, uh, I think we, we were in a good way and we have a lot to talk about uh, over the coming months and years. So we have, not to ignore our online uh, uh, participants, a couple questions. Uh, the first one for Dan and then the second one for Maureen. So the first question is, what are the most promising scientific approaches to HIV vaccines that are in early development now? Any thoughts from you, Dan? Uh, sure. So th there are a number of concepts that are being developed. Uh, one of the larger concepts is to use a series of envelope proteins that are engineered to prime a germline response and then uh, guide the B cell ontogeny on the way towards neutralizing antibodies. I think there's a lot of scientific um, interest in that approach. Uh, I think it would be very practical or very impractical to implement if it is successful and also uh, uh, no, no actual proof of concept in humans yet that we can actually get to broadly neutralizing antibodies. So very interesting, but very early stage. There's also uh, concepts to develop epitope modified envelope proteins to try to uh, induce neutralizing antibodies against those epitopes or polyvalent approaches or uh, other uh, mixture type approaches. And then there also are T cell approaches, such as um, Lewis Picker's CMV vaccine is, is in early phase clinical trials now, and possible combination approaches to try to combine T cell approaches with antibody approaches. Great. Thanks. Another another epitope approach is uh, the uh, the fusion peptide approach developed by Peter Kwong, which has shown some promise in animal models. Uh, so, so there are there are a number of different approaches that are being tried. I would say that uh, they're scientifically very interesting, but clinically very early stage. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Dan. And this question uh, for Maureen: Considering that we are in a discovery phase around an HIV vaccine, how do we message that to communities who are losing trust in the science? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that question. Um, so. Uh, I guess, um, I think I just wanted, first of all, to, I mean, uh, start from uh, from the UNAIDS report. Um, I think that was actually released uh, uh, this, uh, this, this week on Wednesday. It was launched on Wednesday, which is actually showing, you know, some appalling uh, statistics. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, as communities and of course for different stakeholders, but also as, as communities, that's something that should definitely get us on our toes. I think it's a reminder that there's still a lot of work uh, to be done uh, as far as you know ending this uh, pandemic is, is concerned. And I think as I mentioned earlier in my, in my talk, um, we have a lot of exciting HIV prevention tools available, uh, including long acting uh, injectables. Uh, but I think the need for vaccine actually remains. And I think Ian actually mentioned 
that we know that I think also you also emphasize that we know that the only way we're going to end this HIV pandemic is uh, through an HIV vaccine. We know that, you know, uh, with an HIV vaccine, it actually provides that long lasting protection that communities actually uh, need. And we also know that through an HIV vaccine, we could actually eliminate some of the adherence and stigma and uh, um, problems associated with uh, HIV uh, treatment uh, and also other other uh, other uh, um, uh, prevention options that are actually available um, um, currently on the market. Uh, but also we know that with the vaccine, it's, it's likely going to be cost effective in a way compared uh, to, for example, to life, uh, you know, a lifetime of a treatment, especially um, knowing that resources are not um, uh, infinite. So of course there are some benefits. Uh, there are a lot of benefits as why well. we still need uh, a, a vaccine. And I think I know in this conference, we have also been talking a lot about the spillover benefits, right? Um, and how uh, vertical pro uh, disease programs, uh, especially HIV programs like PEFA and Global Fund have had that spill over benefits on the entire health system. And I know this is also something that we know the HIV vaccine research, um, we have seen in the HIV vaccine research. We know that beyond the HIV investment, uh, HIV, the, uh, the investment in HIV vaccine research has actually helped to strengthen uh, the health system. And that HIV vaccine research has greatly contributed you know, to medical advances for other diseases, and I think COVID is just an example. So yes, there may be the fatigue, <laughs> uh, the frustration on the, on the on the part of the community, but I think there are so many uh, um, uh, there's the, the examples that I've just provided. I think should be enough motivation and reason for communities, not just for communities, but also for other stakeholders, including the industry, uh, you know, to continue um, the search uh, for an effective HIV vaccine. Are you good? We we feel like we lost you. I'm here. No, no, come. Th no, sorry, Maureen. It's somebody in the audience. No, we'd love to hear your question. We're no, there, are, there is no exclusion here at the IAS. <laughs> okay, so I'll go very quickly. Um, I work in the social services department at the CVIS at the MUHC here in Montreal. Um, I want to be a little bit of a devil's advocate. I think you should definitely develop community expertise in vaccines. I think you have a, a good um, center for it at AVAC, but um, you really need to be sure, reasonably sure of your product before you kick it up. Uh, I was on the AIDS Vax GP120 uh, study in the community advisory board. I was called to a meeting at AVAC when the Janssen vaccines were begin mosaic vaccines were starting up, and vaccines develop hope in people. And unlike ARVs and, and virology, immunology so far has not been a steady upward progression. And so there's only so many times that people can have their hopes dashed. And even with COVID, what COVID looks like right now is in a developed country, four shots a year for a vaccine that does not confer preventive immunity and will constantly be trapped in that as, ev as successive waves of new variants develop. There's a huge amount of vaccine anger and resistance. And some of the community-based organizations in Montreal, for example, were very silent on COVID vaccination because so much of HIV community work has been anchored in individual autonomy. And public health, when it promotes vaccination, sometimes does so with a heavy hand. So that's an issue that needs to be dealt with very carefully. I would recommend that you develop core community constituencies, a few group of people in developed northern countries, because that's where the profits are going to be made, and in the global south. Uh, and you cultivate that as embers, and those embers remain glowing while the research is going. And then when you have a successful product, blow on those ember embers and use those people as peer educators to spread the message. That would be my recommendation. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, salient advice. Thank you so much, and a terrific way to end. I think both hope, but also some sobering messages there. And I think that tension of of timing is absolutely key and critical. We're getting to the end of our 
uh, our panel. I'm going to quickly go through this wonderful panel and ask you just for a, a just one word of what of a take home that you would like to give. Um, so we'll 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 start at the end there um, with you, Sean. I think we see a good start of this enterprise partnership. I think this is great. Also, being a vaccine researcher and uh, I develop vaccine, uh, we don't have time today to talk about science. Actually, I hold a very different view that is HIV vaccine is so difficult. We have to ask ourselves whether we are on the wrong track. So we have data can show you each of the tests that work so far, they may have some deficiency. We so obvious, we probably ignore. So I personally think one of the message at the end is we should keep hope. And also I support what Dan said. Right now in scientific field, we are getting narrower and narrower. We just bet on one idea, which I think is very dangerous. Great, thank you. Jan? Yeah, I, from my perspective, what I take home is it's um, all about communication and trust, and it's all about collaboration. And collaboration is not only between different stakeholders, uh, you know, between community and regulators and industry, and you know, but it's also collaboration between different companies because you may have a fantastic T cell epitope, I may have a fantastic adjuvant, others may have a wonderful B cell inducing kind of strategy. And how do we put that all together? And how do we get this, you know, into implemented into our clinical trial programs? I think this is quite challenging, but we can overcome it if we collaborate. And to your point from the Fred, you should have, um, I think, from the Hutch, sorry, uh, you, should, you should have some trust in us because there is precedence. Yeah. We have developed medicines small molecules, which are now taken by millions of people for a price which was unthinkable when mm. we developed that. And I think the same is able and will happen with vaccines. Thank you. Valerie? I'm going to ask you to keep it short, if that's OK. So um, in Johnson & Johnson, we have a very long-standing commitment to HIV on the side of drugs and now also on the side of uh, developing a vaccine. and. Um, I think it's very important, this type of partnerships and this type of panel, and I really want to thank you again, uh, because we need to be supported, to be energized, uh, and uh, seeing all the HIV community uh, supporting the effort is very, very important to us, uh, very important to all the colleagues who are working in this field. Mm, thank, thank you. You. Uh, you you asked for the take-home message, right? Um, for me, it's... Um, yeah, always uh, as a reflex, uh, think about rollout at every stage. Is what I heard loud loudly today. Yeah. Uh, so Dan, what about your thoughts? Quick sticks, and then Maureen. I think we need more diversity in the field. Uh, I think that uh, the 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 early stage research is focused on a dangerously small number of concepts at the present time. And I think we need more diversity in the field, and then we need the partnerships uh, and the resources to bring more ideas forward. Thanks, Maureen. You're you're the last word in the in the panel before Carrie. Yeah, thank you so much. I think I would just touch on what uh, the last uh, speaker from the, I think from the audience just mentioned. Um, I think for me, it's about kind of continuing to cultivate hope uh, in communities. Uh, I think we know with uh, HIV vaccine research, we have learned that you know failure is uh, is inevitable. Uh, but uh, we know that from the trials that have failed, there are some important lessons that we have learned from there. But sometimes those lessons remain with us as researchers and, and and industry partners. We we are not able to you know to let communities to appreciate. So we need to find way you know the the lessons that we can learn from trials that have not been successful. So we need to find ways on how can we break down the science so that communities should be able to appreciate so even though clinical trials did not meet the expected endpoint outcomes but there are still some important lessons to learn from there that can you know take us to the next step so it's important to com communication but also we need to continue to instill help in the communities by making sure that they are aware about the important lessons we are learning up, uh, along the way thank you beautiful uh thank you to awesome panelists and i'm gonna ask carrie to give his 
uh, summing up of, of where we are today. Yep. Thank you. And thank you to all the panelists and thank you to the IES for sponsoring this session. I mean, I think me being this the first uh, in-person conference in a couple of years, it's been really, really energizing. And I think bringing people together in the same room really makes a difference. And I think that's been missing the last two years, even though we do get together on Zoom, it's just not the same in terms of develop, developing those uh, relationships. So I think uh, kudos to the IES and, and Brigitte for, uh, you know, for leading this charge and bringing everybody together. And I think obviously we can do more things together rather than alone. So I think this is uh, really, really the take home message for me. Beautiful. And it's an old African proverb. If you want to go quick, go alone. If you want to go far, then go together. And, and you know, I think this is uh, maybe go all the way to a successful vaccine. So thank you, everyone, for your great participation. Um, and yes, even though it's a small audience uh, in, in the room, we've had people online as well. I want to thank those folk for persisting. Maureen, for being up so late. Thank you. Um, and all of you enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a wonderful uh, time. Thanks, Deb.